wherever you go, there we are. My guest today has spent her life devoted to music, classical music mainly. Um, she is a soprano who studied opera and actually performed as a soprano with opera companies throughout Canada and internationally. About 12 years, I guess, into her career singing opera, she decided to do something, well, some of us may may think it was a little crazy, but uh, she certainly didn't. She decided to move home to Newfoundland and Labrador and start a professional opera company here in St. John's. And it's called Opera on the Avalon. By God, she did it. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome to the program the soprano, artistic director, founder, Cheryl Hickman. Hi, Cheryl. Hey, Carl. Pleasure to be here. Pleasure to have you here. Let's start with you as a little girl. I'm curious as to how you became interested in music and especially classical music as a youngster. I didn't become interested in classical music as a child. I was interested in all music. So my parents uh, told me that you know when I was young, I sang before I spoke. So, and in those days, of course, you know, driving in Newfoundland, we lived in Topsail and going back and forth to school, the radio was always on. So even to this day, I know some pretty horrendous 70s music that I don't know why I know all the lyrics to, but I do. So um, I grew up, I think, uh, loving all sorts of music. And in Newfoundland, most of the music was, I would say, folk-based at that time. Mm -hmm. So I grew up learning that music and then got involved with, uh, I went to Catholic school, so that was all uh, mm -hmm. choirs and the choral tradition. And that's, I think, how I started to learn and to love more, you know, what we would now consider Western-based classical music. Mm -hmm. um, but so, yes, I, I think I had the ear for it at an early age. And then once I started, um, you know, junior high and high school I started to take voice lessons and then realized that my voice probably wasn't best suited to folk music. <laughs> it was suited to classical. But at the time, I mean, I really didn't see my first opera until I had left Newfoundland and was at university. So because it really wasn't something that was offered here all that much and, mm -hmm. and it wasn't accessible. So it's uh, now we think, you know, the internet and television. But in those days when I was growing up, it, there, there wasn't a lot uh, to be seen locally for sure. Now, uh, most people who get into music professionally have somebody in their immediate family or a relative at least who uh, was very musical. Mm -hmm. is, is that your case? No. Wow. So, uh, no, not at all. Um, but I think my, my parents were smart enough and, and uh, we were lucky enough that we were put into music lessons or in sports and all of these things, right? So um, that was a, a real privilege of my childhood that I was, I had parents who were forward thinking enough to, to put us in. Mm -hmm. You know, I think kids nowadays don't often get um, all of those activities the way we did when we were growing up. So they put me in music and I did piano and, and, and that, that also I think was the Kiwanis Music Festival tradition here. That, sure. that was just what you did. Mm. So, um, you know, everyone, it was considered cool if you could play an instrument or guitar or piano or whatever, everyone did those things. Um, and I think I learned to be a creative person early because of, of that. Mm. So, um, yeah, I don't know where it comes from, but I also think most uh, Newfoundlanders and Labradorians are musicians at heart. Like everyone is musical here, right? People play things, they do things, they sing. It's an oral tradition of storytelling. Mm. So I think it was just, you know, in the atmosphere and, and that's what it was. But I also think sometimes the, it's a mystery, the voice, right? It, it's, it, for, especially for opera singing, um, you don't pick it, it picks you. And the voice is either there or it is not. So it's not something that you can just practice into existence. You can get better, but unless the voice is there, it's, it, it's not gonna be something that you manufacture. Right. I'm curious now to know how your mom and dad reacted when you said to them, I think I would like to become an opera singer. 
I had incredibly supportive parents who insisted on um, a very strong work ethic, and they didn't care what I did, but I had to be the best at it. Mm -hmm. So um, that's just how we were raised. So that if you're going to do it, it I could be a plumber, I could be you know whatever, but I had to be the best plumber. So you know that was a a gift that they gave me. Um, that they wanted me to happy to be happy in, in whatever I chose to do, um, but that I think the expectation was um, be the best at it. So when I said music, they did everything they could to support me, um, and they did. It, you know, there were a lot of sacrifices um, to send me to the places that I wanted to go to. It wasn't inexpensive, um, and they made those sacrifices, and I'm grateful for them. So, but you know, that's don't, fabulous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. You were very lucky. Very. Um, so, I'm thinking, you know, we have great music educators here, but to sing at the level at which you wanted to sing must have required you going away somewhere to study. I so, left. Did you? I did. I left here at um, 17. I, my voice teacher was Catherine Harrington, which I know a lot of people hmm. will very fondly remember. Um, and she was, she instilled in me as a teenager the love of music. And she, I, she was such a huge, it, I would say, influence in my life to go on and do music. And I didn't feel I could go to Memorial because I had, like, I loved her so much that I felt it would be disloyal, right? It, that's just how you are as a, as a younger person. So I went to the University of Toronto and then I did my undergraduate training there and then opera school and then went to the Juilliard School for my. Um, master's training and I did a program there called the Juilliard Opera Center which is the professional division of Juilliard um, and it was the experience of a lifetime I'm, it was yeah it, it was really exciting exhilarating terrifying because you felt like you were tested every day but being in a city where you see the best of the best all the time forces you to raise your level and also gives you a realistic um, view of where you sit in the world, right? So when you, like I was, you know, a, a young person from St. John's, Newfoundland, I thought, how will I ever be able to, you know, perform with these people? And of course, people from here are amazing, right? We are a creative, uh, talented um, population, and there's Newfoundlanders and Labradorians everywhere. And I found that to be so in New York City, too. Yeah. But what an experience to be in, you know, the greatest city in the world, in my opinion. Me too. Um, and to be exposed to all of what you must have been exposed to there. I mean, you, you must have, uh, you must have met people and seen people perform who became kind of idols to you in, in a sense. And I guess in, in New York, you would have been able to see lots of live opera. Well, we got th not only opera, everything. Like I think mm. the job of a professional musician and an artist is to see everything. I think if you just see, um, you know, opera, you're really missing out. Mm. So I tried to soak up as much as I could. And the great thing about Juilliard is people give you tickets. So like if, you know, patrons and donors to the ballet or the opera or musical theater shows, they would give, if they couldn't go to see their seats, um, and sometimes organizations, they would send them to Juilliard. So we would go every day and see what tickets had come in, and then you'd go. Um, but I, I remember my first week at school, and um, I moved in, and I was going to school, and Robin Williams came down the hall, because of course he was a, a Juilliard alumni. That's right, he was. And, uh, and that was common, that you would see you know, things like that. Christopher Reeves spoke at my um, convocation. Like, that was normal. Mm -hmm. So it was, you know, you just got used to it, as, as used to it as you can mm -hmm. get. Um, but being surrounded by um, that level of talent is really inspiring. Mm -hmm. And being mm -hmm. able to see that and, and access it and, and um, just as part of your daily, you know, experience was, I would say, life-changing for mm -hmm. me. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned that because I think most people, when they hear the word Juilliard, think music, but it's also a drama school. It's uh, drama, dance, music. Mm. So yeah. there was like my roommate was an actor, and uh, you know, and, and I see her on TV every once in a while. Right, that's the the type of experience you had. So it is a very small school at the time I was there. I think it was only 500 students in all. Yeah. Um, and it's a really, really well-rounded education, but it, I found it um, to be the most, you know, one of the most uh, amazing experiences of my life, and yeah. I think back on it very, very fondly. So when, uh, 
when you're actually learning uh, an opera, um, an aria, let's mm -hmm. say, is there is there is there a temptation to kind of do it the way you've heard one of your idols do it, or how, what what's the process that you go through in in learning it? So there is, but I also think you know operas. That it's changing a lot now, but in, in, you know, when I was really performing the most, people have their star singers that they like and they want you to sing it like that. I think that's absolutely ridiculous. So, you know, I would never listen to singers before because then you get it in your head and you sing it like them. And the job of an artist is not to mimic other people, right? Mm -hmm. It's, I like singers and artists who are individuals. And that to me is the most exciting artist. So if I wanted to just regurgitate what Maria Callas had done, that's not very mm -hmm. exciting for anybody, including mm -hmm. myself. Um, so my process for learning pieces has always been uh, I start with the rhythm and the text and then only after I have that uh, do I then go to uh, the notes because it all starts really from the text. What about language? Because when I think of opera I think it Italian, sure. <laughs> German, you know, all of these foreign languages. What, how much of a challenge is that for you in, in terms of, uh, you know, learning, interpreting? Huge, but at the same time, you are taught as a young singer, and I think this is why classical singers, it takes us so long to start performing as professionals, because the training is so rigorous and intense. So, you know, by the time I finished Juilliard, I was 28, right? It takes that long. So languages, diction, style, repertoire, even learning it, like it takes about six months to learn you know, any major role, that's how long it takes. It is a very intensive, time-consuming process. So it's, uh, yeah, it, it's, um, you learn languages as you go. I spent some time in Italy. I, I still spend time in France, and, and so I, you know, always try to improve my languages just for my own sake. Um, but it's, uh, languages are a huge part of it. I've done Czech, Russian, you know, German, French, Italian, but most of the work actually, um, that I do now, and, and we uh, commission our own pieces, it's all English, mm. so, and translated into French. But it's, uh, you know, it, I think the old idea of what people have of what opera is and what it is now are, are very divergent. So it's most of the pieces now that we do certainly are, are in the language of, of what we speak here in Newfoundland mm. and Labrador. Mm. You've, you've performed in, in various places. Uh, I, I imagine you've, you've, you've performed in big houses, smaller venues, what have you. What, what was that whole experience like? It's funny because I find it more nerve-wracking and have found it more nerve-wracking to perform here, probably because my friends and family are here, so it always means a lot more. Um, I always found New York City to be really exhilarating, but I didn't, uh, I never felt very nervous there because I thought, oh, it doesn't matter. There's, you know, it's it's almost so big that you let go of that mm. nervousness. Yeah. Um, singing in a big house again is what you're trained for. You're not mic'd, or sometimes they do what's called sympathetic amplification, which is just a ceiling mic. Uh, but generally, you, you know, you have to learn to sing in those houses. That's the terrifying part because as a young singer, you really don't know. So adjusting to the acoustic and all of those things depending on the size of the house can be slightly uh, terrifying. But it's, I really enjoyed it. The bigger house, the better. It's, it's to be uh, on stage singing with an orchestra of 40 or is an amazing life experience. And uh, yeah, I, I really, uh, I sang the most, I think, at the New York City Opera Theater. Um, and that, that was really very, very fun. Didn't, I didn't get nervous there, but yet I get nervous at the Arts and Culture Center, so go figure. <laughs> The home crowd. Yeah, and you don't and you don't see yeah. people like the smaller the theater sometimes can be more intimidating because yeah. you see people very easily, whereas um, bigger houses with the lights and the setup and the stage you could be anywhere. So I, it it never phased me. The the larger the house, the easier it was for me. So so when you're uh, you, you know going through rehearsal. Um, who who is it that kind of has the primary role uh, in, in shaping the performances uh, apart from the you know the performer himself herself? But you know there's the, you have a director and you have a composer or and not a conductor. a conductor I should say mm -hmm. uh, maybe sometimes a you have the composer yeah but a conductor and, and and a director for sure. 
uh, is, is, is that a collaborative process when it comes to shaping, or how does that work? In the best experiences it is. Mm -hmm. So again, the tradition of opera has often been uh, that you're working with people who really do not want collaboration, right? When I was uh, first singing, I think it was very, uh, sometimes that there were dictatorships, it wasn't collaborative, and that can be problematic. Mm -hmm. And I think now, um, as the art form is evolving and people figure out what, like any best practice at work, how do people work best? I always think that people work best in a circle, right? When everybody's mm -hmm. ideas and uh, contributions can be uh, given equally. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day though, it does, you know, the responsibility rests with the director and the conductor. They're the ones who are really, I think, tailoring the show to what they want it to be and, wh and what their, um, artistic vision is. So yes, everyone else contributes to that, but it is the the uh, conductor and mm -hmm. the director who mm -hmm. are most, and also the designers, you know, the, the costume designer, the lighting designer, um, projections, all of that. Uh, it's, you know, got to be one melding mm -hmm. of, uh, of art forms there. Well, one thing that, uh, that I, I've always been curious about, occasionally you will hear about a film director for example, I, I think I saw a documentary the other day on the uh, movie director William Friedkin, and he said that at one point he had directed an opera. We work with Ruth Lawrence, so you know Ruth is a film director, and, yeah. and Ruth did our show um, last year of Three Decembers, and she just did our show of February. So, it's we really like to have, I think. Um, there's no strict rules anymore of who you can work with. And often when you bring in people from outside your own genre, that's when you get the most exciting and fresh collaborations. Yeah. So I think the rules, as we used to know them, is if you work in one, you know, you work in theater or opera or yeah. musical theater, you can't cross those lines. No, yeah. it, those days are gone. And, right. and now I think we get our most fun mm. um, experiences. And, and certainly um, we have found it to be the most exciting mm. Uh, and beneficial to the work is to work with people outside of, of what we call traditional opera. Well, that certainly makes sense. Now, let's talk about uh, opera on the Avalon. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how did that come into your head that this is something you wanted to do, and how did, how did you manage to make it happen? It was um, my dear late friend Jennifer Matthews from Corner Brook mm -hmm. and, and we had the idea together to start it and it started out as a napkin. We went to lunch at Blue on Water and she's like, you, we should do this and, and that's what we did. Uh, because there wasn't a lot of classical music here in opera, it was, um, and really we're the only opera company east of Montreal, professional opera company east of Montreal, so even in the Atlantic region it didn't exist. Um, and that's how it started. So it's it's really transitioned. This is our 15th year anniversary this year, wow. and you know we have now uh, three commissions under our belt. We've just signed a deal for a new musical. Uh, you know we're doing a lot of film and digital work. It's a really exciting time, but it's also you know the company's grown and changed a lot from what it first was because we do now a lot of multidisciplinary work. We work with all sorts of artists. It's not just opera. We work with theater artists, bands, everyone. Because to us, the province is operatic in its scale, oh. in its themes, in its stories. So, you know, we always say the land is our stage and, and that's what it is. Mm. Now, um, since, since Opera on the Avalon has existed, mm -hmm. you've done the, you know, classic operas like Tosca, La Boheme, you've even done American Musical Theatre, mm -hmm. uh, Carousel, I believe. But you've commissioned works as well, like ours, which uh, was about, about Beaumont Hamill. Beaumont Hamill and Shauna Dithit, and now February, your latest uh, endeavor, which I, I get based on Lisa Moore's uh, wonderful novel, and uh, as a backdrop, the Ocean Ranger disaster. Um, just, just talk about uh, about those works because this is this is really what, to my mind, this is the real significant work that that Opera on the Avalon does. How how do you come up? How, how long does it take from the time you come up with an idea until you actually see it visualized on stage? So, and I would say that goes to the change of the company. So we used to commission, or sorry, we used to uh, present and produce work of other composers. Um, you know, Bohem, Puccini, um, Traviata, you know, things like that. 
we won't be doing that anymore. Mm -hmm. So, and again, we are only going to be commissioning, producing, touring our own work. And that's a change in, in again, I, I think COVID made us look at what we were doing. It gave us time, you know, often in the arts and cultural industries, you don't have time to breathe because you're always going to the next thing, right? Things are programmed. Um, and it gave us time to take a breath and to say, what do we really want to do and what is the purpose of the company? And it gave me time to think about what my artistic purpose is. And for me, it's to create and commission new work about this place, about who we are, uh, about stories that are important to everyone here, but also themes that resonate with everyone around the world. So that's changed for our organization. No one needs to see us do Bohem. There, mm -hmm. Lots of people are doing Bohem better than we ever will. But no one is doing stories about this place mm. in opera. So that was a change that we wanted to bring about so that you know, going forward now we, we, we will be commissioning and, and presenting and producing our, our own work only, both digitally and um, you know, actual productions. It takes about three years, three to four years for any show. So from the time, uh, you know, February, which we just finished, uh, that was four years because we had the COVID year in there with the COVID two years. Um, but generally it's a three year cycle. And from, you know, by the time you figure out who you're gonna hire to compose it, uh, who the librettist will be, which is the fancy opera word for, you know, who's gonna write the script. Um, then you have to do workshops and you have to see if it works, right? So mm -hmm. sometimes it doesn't. Um, or, you know, significant edits and then you bring singers in. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so the first bit of it, the first year is really just the librettist working uh, with the composer and then you start to do acting workshops. So it's, it's a very intensive collaborative process. Um, so yes, it's, it's, uh, it's certainly time consuming, but for us, it's, it's where the most interesting work for our organization exists for sure. But it also sounds to me, I mean, it, this is such a specialized thing, opera. It, it, to me, it seems like you would have to reach outside of Newfoundland and bring people in to help you produce these things. I mean, composers, librettists you mentioned, and uh, there must be a whole range of uh, singers as well. I don't know whether we have enough singers here. Uh, we don't have enough singers yeah. here, not, not to do the work that yeah. we're doing. Some of them, like we have lots of singers from here who are, who are mm. working in our shows, and of course the orchestra's all from here. Mm. Um, but singers at the level of which we need them, there's really only, you know, mm. I think there's Dave Pomeroy is, is living here. You mm. know, there's really no, mm. I would say, professional opera singers who are singing all over the world mm. living here. Because most people are, again, we're, you know, we're nomads, right? We go everywhere. Mm. Um, it does take a lot, but again, we're challenged the idea of who works on those shows. So, you know, Lisa Moore, who, who wrote February, the novel, mm -hmm. she's the co-librettist of the show. So she had never done that before. Mm -hmm. uh, when Robert Chafe uh, did the libretto for hours uh, about Thomas Nangle from, uh, from the Rolling Flying mm -hmm. Regiment, mm -hmm. he had never done that before either. Mm -hmm. So, you know, sometimes, I, well, why, why can't you? Like there's, we try to get rid of the rules of how people have existed in the past. Well, you shouldn't do that. I think, well, why shouldn't you? So now I will say that we generally, if we have somebody new to the process, we put them with a composer who is very used to the process so that we, we don't want to have two kind quote newbies together. Mm. Um, so, you know, Robert worked with a wonderful composer named John Astachio who had done multiple operas. So, and that was a very um, collaborative and easy process. And, and we found the same to be uh, with February as well. I think Laura and Lisa, uh, Laura Kaminsky is the composer of February and they're mm -hmm. fast friends. So mm -hmm. it's, I think sometimes the, the most difficult work is finding the right teams to go together because what you do not want to have uh, are people who are, are just not good fits and sometimes you don't know that till you're till you're in the process but so far and I'll knock on wood mm -hmm. uh, we've been very lucky with uh, everybody that we've worked with on the new commissions mm. um, speaking of people who aren't good fits I, have you ever had an experience where you know you've cast somebody in a role and after the fact you you thought you know that person really didn't connect with the audience really didn't connect with the role Perhaps I should have gone with somebody else. Sure, but uh, I think sometimes you just don't know. And again, we cast a lot of emerging artists, and, and you're taking a chance. But I think the chance is the exciting part of it. Sometimes it really, really works, and when it doesn't, you have to, to help, especially an emerging artist, to figure out why it's not working, right? So um, 
that's more the challenge of working with artists to bring the best out in them, and often mm -hmm. that's what it is. Mm -hmm. um, Opera can sometimes be and has had the reputation and orchestras for being um, toxic in how you know certain conductors are or directors. So we make sure that we just don't invite those types of personalities into our spaces. And I think when you have artists who are really focused on bringing out the best in the cast that they have, that that's what you get. So, but yes, you know, we've had a couple of instances where I thought I really don't want to work with that person again, and then you don't, right? So it's. Yeah. yeah, it can be challenging, but so, you know, artistic people are artistic people. How how has the St. John's audience been responding to opera on the Avalon over the past uh, many years of its existence? Now, I mean, because you've had to educate people, I guess, in a certain to a certain extent about about opera. We have, but I also think that the it's funny because we did Tosca a few years ago, which is you know one of the I would say. Uh, it's a big money maker for a lot of companies that do it. It didn't make a lot of money for us, and we sold maybe half of the house, which is funny. And people, uh, when we put up the titles, because we do um, sir titles so people can understand, because it was in Italian, they laughed at the wrong places. Because again, it's not their tradition, right? Mm. So I think, why are you laughing there? But of course, they're laughing there because a lot of the language is archaic or the themes that, like, so, you know, the audiences that we have for our shows, and I think, um, St. John's is a really sophisticated audience for theater, especially, that they like new work and they like to see things of this time. Like Dead Man Walking for us, which was a show, uh, a new opera we did mm -hmm. in Three Decembers, they sold very, very well. Mm -hmm. The older, more established rep that works in other markets does not work for us. Um, so again, it, it's the tradition may not be here, uh, except for a few of the real diehards, but the tradition that is here is theater. And we have a very long uh, established theater community, and I think that community has now come to see the work that we're doing. Cheryl, thank you. Uh, and continued success to you and Opera on the Avalon. And that's it for this edition of Carl Wells Point to Point. Thanks for watching, folks. See you again next time.